Listen, it's a pleasure to be with everybody this morning. Um, it was such a great opportunity for me to undertake this research on behalf of the National Parents Primary Council. And um, I came to it with a little bit of experience. I'm a mom of three kids, so I know all about kids with loud voices and uh, wanting to participate in adult uh, decisions. But, um, but it was a huge learning experience for me, and I'm excited to share some of my knowledge, some of the knowledge I gained with you this morning. Um, I'm going to walk you through a brief history of children's rights, really brief, and we'll talk about a model for implementing those rights, kind of a theoretical model for how to go about implementing them. And then we'll talk about some of the barriers and the challenges, and we'll also touch on why it's so important to engage the voice of the child and their participation in decisions that affect them. And we'll talk about a little bit of the research that I accessed in terms of what are the, what's the impact, why do we do it? So. Um, First, we'll start with the history. And uh, listen, for most of human history, children have been in a state of nobodiness. In other words, they were invisible, um, literally considered parents' property. So um, this picture of, I think we've got up here, yes, of this is an 18th century farm. But what's important to note about this is that the children weren't, by legal standards, any different from the cattle in this picture. Now that's not to say parents didn't love their children and take care of their children, but just the reality was they were their parents' property for most of human history. They did not have any le individual legal status, um, and they labored in farms and factories. And um, so even the idea that children had rights is a relatively new idea. And I would say we think of this as history, but obviously in Ireland and in my home country in, in the United States, there's a raging debate about when children actually gain individual rights. So it's history, but it's also very present. Um, uh, so back to the 18th century, the, even the idea that children were not their parents' properties and could be abused arose with the Prevention to Cruelty to Children's Societies in New York and London. <laughs> um, and this resulted in legislation in, in England which um, recognized for the first time that children had individual rights, that they could be abused, that their parents could be prosecuted for abusing children, that children could be separated from their families. So it was the very first time, this is 1903, that children gained actual legal status. Um, several international declarations followed, and most of these were around the provision of basic needs, adult responsibilities for, to children for the provision of shelter, food, medicine, protection, and protection from exploitation. After World War II, there was an additional uh, declaration that, that um, really focused on, on adult responsibilities to children. Um, and these are all very protective measures. The idea that adults have obligations towards children, that children should be protected from um, want, basically. Now, um, this takes us up to sort of the 60s and 70s. And at that time, there was a sort of a new philosophy that emerged. We can call it sort of the liberation movement for children. It was very en vogue to, to talk about children's self-determination as being an absolute right, that children should be able to sort of be freed from the tyranny of desult, adult decision-making. That was kind of a little bit extreme. But the, the premise was is that um, the right to self-determination should not be age-related. Do you know that if, if adults can make bad decisions, so should children be able to? Um, so what we have in the background are these two kind of opposed models. One that's a very protective model, some would, might say paternalistic, and the other one, which is the emancipation model, which is kind of, whoo, 70s, you know, <laughs> kind of extreme. Both really are very problematic at the end of the day, because the protectionist model can underestimate children's capacity and their, their ability to form opinions, to have opinions, <coughs> to contribute. Whereas the liberationist model is really, has been debunked by years and years of, of research into parenting practices. We all know that children need discipline, that they need boundaries, that they need structure. structure. And recent research into authoritative parenting has sort of fairly much established that children do need adults adult decisions, they need, they need structure and boundaries and discipline. So we're sort of now in the middle 
of those two extremes. And a gentleman named Freeman proposed this idea of liberal paternalism, which kind of accepts adult authority, but also recognizes the incredible responsibility of adults to make decisions for children in their best interests, which ultimately <coughs> is about advancing the goal of rational independence for children, of, of, of their, their future development into adults that are as capable as possible. So um, this, this is a bit theoretical, but the, the concept that is proposed is future-oriented consent. So the question to ask ourselves is, would our ch children, in the fullness of time, <coughs> experience and knowledge, accept that these decisions that we're taking on their behalf were made in their best interests? You know, so it's a big responsibility. Um, and that's sort of the thing to think about, that we, that we are engaging with what is actually in the best interest of the child. Now these two sort of models of thinking about children um, and the sort of the, the liberal paternalistic mode um, landed us in what has been really a watershed moment in, in the history of children's rights, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. This was in 1989, and for the first time, children, according to the United Nations and all of the signatories, which is almost everyone except for the United States, just happens to be. We sometimes are exceptionary, exceptional in, in international courts, apparently. Um, uh, so, um, sorry. Uh, for the first time, children are considered not just future citizens, but active current citizens with the right to their own voice, with the right to participate fully in civic life, okay? The, the, um, the language is that a child who is capable of forming his or her own views has the right to express those views, and the views should be given due weight in accordance with the age and maturity of the child about decisions that affect them. So it's, it's, it's a really quite a radical departure for children's rights, which had previously been all about the protection of the child. This all of a sudden is about the active participation of the child. And this is 1989. Now, um, the convention um, also uh, <coughs> outlines complementary rights. So this right of participation, this right to a voice, is not a standalone right. It, it is a right that can be seen in sort of conjunction with other children's rights, the right to safety, the right to guidance from adults, the protection of their best interest, non-discrimination, and the right to information. So it isn't that the child has a voice and anything goes. <laughs> Do you know? It, it's, it's, it, there's a delicate balance of rights there that all have to be considered. Now, um, it's also important to understand what, what the convention does not do. It does not undermine adult, adult authority. It does not transfer decision-making powers from adult to children. There are also other, I think, problem, problematic areas in the, in, the, in the language, such as, for example, how is capacity to form an opinion defined? It can be quite easy to dismiss, perhaps ch some children, other children, by age or by, by uh, disability, as, um, as incapable. So, I think that's an area where people really have to understand that you need to fight your corner. The second is, how is due weight in decision-making process? How do you determine that? How do you know what that is? So um, it's another area where we need to fight our corner. Um, so that just, to, just to be aware that those are some of the areas where I think have, have, um, have make, may have contributed to some of the difficulties in implementation of children's rights in this area. Now, um, this is a theoretical model um, introduced by a woman named Linda Lundy. Okay, so this is, I'm gonna introduce her, her concepts for some of the ways that we can think about implementing children's rights. So it's sort of like a, a guideline, let's say, to how we can think about achieving this. The first is that children need a space. They have to be given an opportunity to express a view. This doesn't happen by accident. In our institutions, in our schools, across different sectors, there has to be a formal channel by which the opinions of children are sought. The second is voice. Children must be facilitated to express their views. 
And this is important because um, the capacity to form a decision can't really be confused with the ability to express that opinion as adults would. There's lots of different ways that children express their opinions, and it's our responsibility as adults to access that opinion, you know? It isn't about whether the child can come up with a PowerPoint, do 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 five-point plan for how they want to, <laughs> how they want to proceed. Um, adults have a, a real responsibility to access the opinion of their children. And I think here as well, there, there becomes sort of a tricky area of advocacy because as adults, we have our own concerns and we have our own issues. And um, there has to be some sort of, a, one of the things, one of the areas we can fall into is we're expressing our own concerns on behalf of our children. And the advocacy, not that our own concerns aren't important, but advocacy for the voice of the child means accessing the child's opinion and then expressing, helping that child to express their opinion. Which can be, it can be something you're concerned about or something you're not concerned about at all. So it's, um, so, so there's, um, there's a difficult role of advocacy there too because we all have our own concerns. Okay, and the, and the other point is audience. Um, the child's view has to have an audience. It's no good if the child has an opinion, but the appropriate decision makers, the appropriate, the people for whom that, that opinion might help influence a decision are not available or haven't been, or haven't been apprised of it. So the, the, the child's opinion needs an audience. And then influence, and this is the tricky area that we, uh, the implementation often falls down on influence because it is not that the child's opinion is the tiebreaker or the final vote, but there needs to be a feedback loop. The child needs to know how their opinion was influenced the decision-making process, what decision was taken, and why perhaps their opinion was or wasn't was or wasn't influential. Like there needs to be the full circle. So often we have the voice of the child and then everybody's excited, we've listened to the children and then we move on, we make our decision and the children have no idea <laughs> how their voice was, what, you know, what, what the impact was. We need to have the feedback loop so the children understand what the impact of their, of their contribution was. So for those of us that are more visually inclined, um, Lundy presents this as an idea for visualizing how this works. So you've got the Convention on the Rights of the Child. You have the two fundamental rights in Article 12, which is the key article, the right to express a view and the right to have their views given due weight. And the right to express a view necessitates the space, the formal channel, as well as the facilitation of their opinion, their voice. Then the right to have their views given due weight means that the appropriate people have access to their opinions and that they have influence. In other words, that there's a real consideration and a feedback loop to the children and people involved about how their, how their opinions have influenced the process. All of this happens, though, within the understanding that these other rights are also present, that the right to non-discrimination to their best interests, the right to be safe, to guidance and the information are also considerations. So we've gone through a little bit of the history, we've gone through implementation, <coughs> at least like a theoretical model for implementation. <laughs> and um, where are we in the Irish context? Ireland ratified the UNCRC in 1992, um, but it formally, the right to a voice and participation in decision making was formally introduced to the Irish Constitution in the 2012 Children's Referendum. So this is a constitutional right that our children have. Um, I think it's important to really know that. Uh, however, uh, to give a sense of where we are with this, the Ombudsman for Children last year um, made this statement. And I think that it's um, very on vogue to listen to the, to the, to the rights, of the, to listen to the voice of the child, to talk about the voice of the child. But um, in his opinion, um, we have a long way to go because it's very easy to talk about. It's very hard to do. As many of you know, I don't know, with my kids, I find I'm hearing them all the time. I hear them constantly. <laughs> um, 
But in terms of uh, actually listening to them or providing that audience where I'm actually giving them the space to express themselves, it only really happens um, once in my house, and that's like at bedtime. I go around to their three little beds, one at a time, and they generally don't want to go to bed. So they're interested in talking, do you know? Mm -hmm. And then they just come up with whatever they want to talk about. It's like my little visit with them. But it doesn't happen by accident. And, um, and they surprise you, do you know, with what, what they come up with, do you know? Or what's on their mind, do you know? And I find that often adults kind of frame the problem, frame the conversation. And, and um, it's very hard, it's, it's tricky to provide that space where the children actually begin to tell you what's on their mind um, in a meaningful way. Because otherwise it's just like, I want ice cream, I want videos, I want ice cream, I want videos. Beyond that <laughs> is a tricky space. Um, so uh, we're here and we're, in the we're talking about the education sector, which is obviously enormously influential in children's lives. Children spend about 1,000 hours per year in school. It's where their social life happens. It's where their learning and development happens. It's just massively important. Um, and the Ombudsman for Children noted in this uh, Education and Focus report in, in 2015 that nearly half of the complaints received were about the education sector which just gives us a hint into there's frustrations there, there are real frustrations there. And, um, and perhaps we're not doing enough, <laughs> basically, on, on realizing participatory rights and the engagement of the voice of the child in the education sector. So, as I said before, listening to the voice of the child is on vogue. It's extremely, um, it's not an easy thing to do. And so there's less evidence of of real participatory rights in the education sector. But this applies to all sectors now. Um, now, I'm not an expert in all sectors, but I would say, you know, equally in healthcare, in the legal system, there's a lot of different places where progress can be made. Um, some of the barriers are just knowledge of their existence and skepticism about the capacity for contribution, for real valuable contribution. Um, there are also concerns. There's a lingering concern about undermining adult authority. Um, and there's also concerns about the time, expert, and expense associated with the compliance. Um, I think it's, it's, it hasn't been done perhaps as fully as it can be because it is difficult. It doesn't happen by accident. Um, and to go into a little bit like, you know, what's the point? Why? Why do we care? And I think as adults we all know that um, we're bombarded with customer satisfaction surveys. The science of gaining feedback from customers about services is just, just everywhere. It's, it's, um, it's, it's really well developed, in other words. And we know that when we have feedback, that we end up providing more efficient services, we do more of what works well and less of what doesn't work well. And in the family, in schools, in healthcare, in all of these areas, understanding what works and what doesn't work is key. So children are experts in their own lives and they're an incredibly valuable source of information about what works for them. And um, so it just makes sense that we engage with them. It makes sense that we engage with them so that we're spending all of our energy, which we don't have a huge amount of, on things that work. So, uh, so the idea is to make them co-creators of, of children's services rather than passive consumers. Um, and the other thing that's important is that children really do have a unique perspective. There are several studies that suggest that what service providers, teachers, and healthcare workers think work, and what children think work, is just different. They have different opinions. There was a study in the UK that ran across several schools, and they surveyed teachers on the different rewards and discipline measures. And they wanted to know from the teachers what do they think, what were the best, what were the ones that worked really well. And there was wide agreement across the teaching professionals about what they thought worked. They did the same survey to children, and the children agreed with themselves about what they worked, what worked. But the two sets did not. The two sets were completely different. So what the children thought worked and what the professionals thought worked were two sets of different things. And that's interesting in and of itself. Do you know? I mean, it's not necessarily to say that, that either one was I mean, you don't know, basically. But you do know that the opinion is very, very different. The frame is different. Um, 
Another survey, another, uh, another piece of research surveyed um, institutions across different sections in Britain that had formal structures for engaging children's opinions. And 80% of those organizations with formal structures thought that they improved their services because of that. So there is evidence that, that there, is, there are improvements that can be made and that children are a valuable source of information. Um, this one is interesting, it's a quality circle. Quality circle is a Japanese concept, the Kaizen concept of continuous improvement where you get a group of, it's, it's an industrial concept basically, where uh, employees in a manufacturing plant, people who are on the job doing the actual manufacturing, um, get together to discuss ways that they think the system can be improved and then send it upstairs. Um, so this is just taking that concept and putting it in education. And this is a primary school experiment and they just said to the kids, listen, how do you think your school could be improved? Come up with a plan. And the kids decided that the physical layout of the playground could change, and it would reduce bullying and boredom. And they devised an outreach program. They reached out to business leaders. They reported on progress. They um, basically, they implemented it. And uh, they produced a book booklet on new playground games. So I think one of the things I took away from this is that it's very easy to underestimate the capacity of kids. And that somehow that, that participating, listening to the voice of the child, engaging them, is also building the skills that you want them to have. It's building the communication skills, building the analytical skills. You're sort of, it's doing two things. It's improving the school, but it's also developing the children's abilities. So, uh, so that's what I took away from that. Um, and then, okay, so the National Parents Council Primary Program has a, um, they have a program called Partnership Schools Ireland. And this is a, a, a it's a fabulous program. There'll be more information over lunch about it. You can check it out. But it's um, essentially, it engages school administration, <coughs> principals and teachers, students, parents and community members in improvement projects for their schools. Um, and um, students in the primary schools are active members, meaning that they sit in a, with a group of adults talking about this. At first there was a little fluffle about, okay, so what are the students going to call the, the teachers? Because in, in class they call them this, this, and that, and then in, in this meeting everyone's going to use first names and how are we going to get around this, you know? <laughs> what do we do about this? But um, it was overcome. <laughs> the problem was overcome. And, the, you know, there's so many stories, but one of the ones that I love is that the bullying was identified as a real problem in one of the schools. <coughs> and, um, and so the, the adults on the, on, the, on the team were talking about, okay, so we're going to develop leaflets about bullying, and we'll do a little role play, and we'll talk about what you do if you feel like you're being bullied. And the student on the, on the, on the team said, look, you know, the problem with bullying in our school is that at break time, there's a big box of toys, and the big kids get it first, and then the little kids don't have anything to play with. And everything, everyone else was like, oh, Okay, like that's, it, it's, it's a perspective, it's a frame that, you know, identified a problem easily solvable, easily dealt with, that went right over the heads of the administrators. It's so easy to happen. So um, that's one of the stories that I thought was just really telling. This is a similar story, but it's from study in the UK of the National um, Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children. They have lots of children in their care. They're a big organization. And they decided to develop um, child develop customer service, satisfaction service. So they got the kids in their care to help them develop a survey. And it was a hugely informative process because in that process, they realized that one of the primary concerns of the kids was privacy. When they're sitting and talking to their caseworker, they were terrified about what was going to happen to that information where it was going to go, what was going to be confidential, what was not going to be confidential, how it was going to impact the families. And um, again, this was an issue that the care workers just doing their jobs, just chatting away, just filling out their paperwork, it didn't really, wasn't top of mind. And so it changed the way that the organization managed the confidential concerns. Now, they still had legal obligations, but it just changed the way they were much more sensitive to those concerns they were much more, in, they kept the kids much more better informed about what the situation was. And um, they had 
the children developed the survey, they administered their survey over time, and over time they, the results of the satisfaction survey went straight up. So the kids were much more comfortable, much more secure, much more, and I think the social workers are much better able to do their jobs as a result. So another, just another example. Okay, so I'm going to finish up with, um, these are recommendations from the Irish National Children's Office for different ways that um, we can start to think about implementing children's participatory rights. Um, and uh, kids can give feedback about how well services are working. In our own homes, they can give feedback about how well everything is working. <laughs> they probably do already. Um, uh, looking at ways of improving service delivery. They can review and help develop policies, plan new services, advise on ways of improving information for children. Um, and I think all of this applies across sectors. And I think it just, some of these things are just to help us get the juices going and thinking about, okay, so what kinds of, you know, how can I engage my child and be an advocate for my child and start to, and what kind of expectations can I have of the education service and, you know, the other services you may be engaged with, do you know? These are the kinds of things that kids really can actively, their voices, their opinions matter and they can improve services. And, it, and I think if you come at it from a really positive, not like a, not necessarily negative, but like as a very positive sort of, hey, look, you know, this is, this is something that can be, that can make a contribution, that can make a difference. Oh, and this is another one, the peer mentors or peer advocates. I think kids can, it's wonderful groups of kids, do you know, that can really speak for each other and support each other. And I love the idea of the quality circle because I think that there's a real social element to it and kids can find strength in community. Do you know? Um, to take part in staff or volunteer recruitment. I mean, the kids can, can look in and do an interview themselves. Um, participate in meetings and conferences, depending on their age, or, or, you know, be a part of the governance of an organization. At the Partnership Schools uh, Ireland really has kids as part of the governance. They have kids right in there as part of, as part of sort of the board of this, of this team. So that's my piece. It's very general, a little theoretical, but hopefully it's got the juices working and you're thinking about things. Um, I know that I have the long paper. I don't know if anyone would want to do that. But, um, but it is available, and you're, you're more than welcome to it if you do want it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.